Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar today. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about what's new in CockroachDB 19.2 and giving some live demos of some new capabilities. So we released 19.2 last week, and we're all excited to be here talking about it. And I'm going to turn on our video so we can introduce ourselves. Um, <laughs> hey guys, um, my name is Megan. I'm a product marketer here at Cockroach Labs, and um, I'm here with Jesse and Bram. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Hi everybody, Jesse Seldes. I, I head up the education team here at Cockroach Labs. Hi, I'm uh, Bram Grunier. I'm a technical account manager, and I was an engineer here for four years. Uh, uh, one of the earliest engineers at Cockroach. Cool. Um, so just before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Um, so first, please do ask questions throughout the webinar. You can ask them in the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. Um, and make sure you ask them there instead of in the chat section, just because in the Q&A section, the questions are actually saved after the webinar ends. So if we don't get to them, we can uh, send you an email with the answer to your question. Uh, when the webinar ends, we're going to send out a survey. So you'll just see on the screen when the webinar ends, there'll be a link to a survey. Please do fill that out because that's really useful for us. We really value all your feedback. And then finally, uh, after the webinar ends, we're going to also be sending out a recording so you can rewatch it if you so desire. And again, thank you for being here. So I'm going to get started now. And all right. Um, so in the past month, Cockroach Labs has launched three new releases, and I'm going to touch on them briefly here before Jesse was, is gonna dive into some more details about 19.2 and, um, and go into the demos. So Cockroach Labs company mission is to make data easy. And it's an important mission to our founders. It's something that our whole company works towards and we work towards it through our product, our docs, our support team, and all the other resources we have available. But for these three releases, the ones that we've launched in the past month, they're all kind of a variation on that mission. And the central theme that ties them all together is to make distributed SQL specifically easy. So we here at Cockroach Labs, we believe that distributed SQL meets a lot of important needs for a modern database. But we also understand and recognize that it can be difficult to run a distributed database. So in that vein, um, we, we work towards these three new releases in the past month, and I'm just going to do a brief overview of them. So for Cockroach Cloud, this is our fully managed distributed SQL um, service that we launched last month. Um, so it's self-service. You can log on and choose your cloud provider, your nodes. Um, you don't ever have to talk to a salesperson. You just spit, um, fill out this online form, and you can get up and running very quickly. And then we'll manage all um, the day-to-day -day maintenance and operations um, and optimization after that. So if that sounds interesting to you, definitely check it out on our website where you can find some more information. Uh, in, in a similar vein of making distributed SQL easy, we also launched Cockroach University last week. So um, Cockroach University is an online training platform to teach people about distributed SQL and how to get the most out of Cockroach DB. And note that it's free, so definitely go on and uh, check it out, sign up for the lessons if that sounds interesting to you. The first course is getting started with Cockroach DB, and it teaches you the basics. And then we're going to be launching more courses over the coming months. And then finally, 19.2. Um, so that's going to be the focus of this webinar. We launched 19.2 last week, and we really focused on developing new and improved capabilities for multi-region or distributed deployments um, <coughs> through two main vectors. So the first is performance. And the second is usability. And note that while the theme here is for multi-region deployments, all the new capabilities, or many, most of the new capabilities also improve performance and um, usability for single region deployments as well. So if that's what you're running, a single region deployment, um, all this stuff is still rele relevant for you as well. So um, with that introduction, I'm going to pass it off to you, Jesse, to go into more detail and um, start getting into the, the demos and everything. Awesome. All right. Um, let's go to the next slide. Sorry, went too far. 
So hi, everybody. Again, my name is Jesse Seldes. Um, I run the education team here. And picking up on um, themes that Megan introduced, I'm going to talk to you and uh, more importantly, demo for you some of the most impactful and exciting changes in Cockroach 19.2. Uh, and we're going to focus on um, the two themes of performance and usability, as Megan mentioned. I want to I want to mention I want to um, uh, also say that uh, the release includes a lot of really great features and changes. We're only touching on a few of them here. So at the end, we'll we'll point you to the full release notes where you can investigate um, and explore more. But we're going to focus on performance and usability. So in terms of performance, there are two especially significant um, internal changes that increase the speed at which CockroachDB completes client requests. And those are parallel commits and vectorized query execution. Um, and we're going to start with those. Um, then we're going to move on to usability. There are changes there that make it much easier and quicker to set up geo-partitioning, which is one of our most um, important um, features, especially for geo-distributed uh, deployments. Um, and we're also going to talk about some really nice features for rapidly experimenting with CockroachDB wherever you have the binary. Um, so starting with parallel commits, uh, let's briefly talk about how this works before uh, we, we see it in action. Um, essentially, parallel commits is a new atomic commit protocol um, developed by our engineers here at Cockroach Labs that cuts the commit latency of a transaction in half. So from two rounds of consensus um, down to one. So here we have um, a sample transaction to, to help illustrate this. In this transaction, we're writing two values to a fruit table. Um, let's imagine this table is pretty large and these rows are scattered across ranges. So, so looking at how this works first in 19.1 for context, um, it's a, a two-phase commit process. The client starts the transaction and issues the right requests. Um, now, because of a feature introduced in 19.1, called uh, transaction pipelining, those requests are executed in parallel rather than um, sequentially, which is already a huge performance boost. And you can see that um, indicated in the diagram, those first arrows moving from left to right, um, more or less in parallel. Um, so both of those writes go through the process of reaching consensus with the majority of the replicas uh, in the ranges. Now, what's not depicted here are the locations of the replicas that are involved in consensus. So keep in mind, that if this is a geographically distributed cluster and the replicas are spread across different regions, there's potentially significant network latency involved here. And that's, that's significant, that's an, that's an important point. But once both rights um, have reached consensus, then the commit process is kicked off uh, in 19.1, which is another round of consensus um, to update the transaction record. And again, this involves network latency. And then once that finishes, we return acknowledgement um, to the client um, and we asynchronously clean up um, some artifacts of the transaction. So the point is in 19.1 for a transaction, there are two rounds of consensus um, that happen and there's a network latency um, incurred in both rounds of consensus. Um, now, looking at 19.2, you'll see um, that there are no longer two distinct rounds of consensus. It's now essentially a, a one phase commit process where the commit happens in parallel with the rights. And this is a real innovation in 19.2. We have a very, um, very detailed blog post um, on this topic and some really good architecture docs describing the exact mechanics of this um, that I encourage everybody to go check out. But in summary, we now make sure that as soon as we know the entire right set of the transaction, even before um, all rights have reached consensus, we initiate the process of committing the transaction. And this allows the rights and commit process to proceed in parallel. Um, and uh, once both stages are uh, complete, we eagerly return to the client and then um, asynchronously finalize the commit and uh, clean up um, the transaction um, art artifacts. So, so in 19.2, one round of consensus from two to one, 19.1, 19.2. Um, big reduction in network latency. So now we're going to actually move over um, and look at a, uh, a real live demo. All right, so what we have here, we have two live CockroachDB clusters. Um, they are identical in essence. They have, each cluster has nine nodes um, spread across three regions of the US, East, Central, and West. Um, you can see the same thing here, if I drag this up. Um, same exact thing, so nine nodes in each cluster. Um, the only difference is that in this cluster, we're running 19.2. Uh, 
And in this cluster, we are running um, the latest uh, version of 19.1. Um, now, um, similarly in both clusters, let's look at the network latency. There's this nice um, uh, so-called debug page that, that visualizes uh, you know, the amount of time it takes to move between different nodes of the cluster. So this is really helpful. Um, looking at nodes one, two, and three here, those are the nodes that are in the east region. Um, if we look at this number, this tells us how long the round trip takes between a node in the east region and nodes in the central region. We can see that that round trip is around 33 milliseconds. So every time you have to do that, you incur 33 milliseconds. So if you have, let's say, a transaction that um, you know it, it needs to reach consensus between east and and, and central um, in 19.1, you're going to get around you know 65, 70, 75 milliseconds because there's two round trips there. Um, whereas in 19.2, you see it is simply one round trip. It's going to be around 30, 35. Uh, milliseconds. Um, all right, so with that background, now we're going to move over to the terminal and we have, um, we have two terminals here. Um, you know, one is connected, this one is connected to the 19.2 cluster, the SQL shell is connected to the cluster, and this one is, uh, is connected to the 19.1 cluster. And we're going we're gonna to do a simple transaction here. Um, where we have two tables, an orders table and a users table. We're going to insert a record into the orders table. And in the same transaction, you know, atomically, we're going to also update um, a user's record and sort of increment an order count. So for, for, you know, we're going to insert an order and that order record has a user ID. And then in the user record, we're going to increment a count. And that's all we're going to do. So 19.1, um, let's see what happens. As you can see, 73 milliseconds, 71 milliseconds, exactly what we talked about. Um, essentially, two, two consensus round trips, you know, 33 milliseconds being one, uh, 71 is, is, uh, encompasses two round trips. So if we go um, over to 19.2, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to increase the font here a little bit to make it even easier for you to see this. Pause for a second. All right, let's see. Hopefully that's a little bit better. So in 19.2, we're going to do the same exact thing. It's the same exact transaction. You know, the UUIDs are different. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. So let's see what happens. 19.2, 35 millisecond latency for the same exact transaction, exactly half. So this is the effect of parallel commits. Um, and this is, this is quite big. I mean, if you, especially for geo-distributed clusters, this cuts down late network latency pretty dramatically. Um, but even in single region deployments, it's important to recognize that this can have a significant, significant impact. If a transaction, uh, for example, um, involves updating a table and multiple secondary indexes, um, this is also going to have a, uh, a noticeable um, um, you know, speed up uh, on those types of transactions as well. All right. So going back to the slides, um, we're going to move on to um, the second um, uh, major uh, performance improvement in 19.2, and that's ve vectorized query execution. Um, but first, a bit of background. OLTP databases or databases optimized for transactional workloads typically store data in contiguous rows on disk and process queries one row of data at a time. And this pattern is ideal for uh, serving small queries with high throughput and low latency. And CockroachDB is definitely uh, such a database. Um, on the other hand, OLAP databases or databases optimized for analytics workloads typically store data in contiguous columns on disk and operate on these columns in batches using a concept called vectorized execution to make more efficient use of modern CPUs. And this pattern is better at serving larger queries quicker. Now, given the key value storage architecture of CockroachDB, we don't store data in columnar format like typical OLAP databases. But in 19.2, we do something new that drastically speeds up more analytics uh, style queries. And that is we convert rows to batches of columnar data in memory after reading them from disk and then feed those batches into a new vectorized query execution engine. So for many common scan, join, aggregation um, type queries that are likely to read a lot of rows, this brings significant um, speed up in execution. 
And again, for this feature, we have a very uh, detailed blog post on the research and the prototyping and the implementation that went into the, uh, the vectorized um, execution engine in 19.2. And we also have um, good docs on the topic. So for, for deeper insights, please uh, do check out those resources. Um, in the docs in particular, I want to call out that you'll find important information about um, current limitations. Um, for example, um, not all data types um, support vectorized execution at this time. Um, that's going to change um, over the next releases. And only queries that are guaranteed to execute in memory without the need to spill over to disk are supported at this, at this time. So, so it's important for people to recognize um, those current limitations that are in the docs. Again, these limitations will be lifted over the course of the next few releases. In fact, the release that's scheduled to go out next week will add support for a few more um, data types. Okay, so let's get into the demo. Um, we're going to run a typical analytics style query from the TPCH benchmark. A lot of people have heard about TPCC. It's talked about a lot. Um, TPCH um, illustrates uh, decision support systems that examine large volumes of data, um, execute queries with, uh, with a lot of complexity, and give answers to critical business questions. So these are analytics queries. Um, and the specific query that, that we'll, we'll run is a slight modification of what's called the pricing summary uh, report query. And it provides a summary pricing report for all line, item, line items shipped as of a given date with totals across metrics like price, quantity, and discount. So a big batch of data. Um, okay, so with that, we're going to, again, switch over to, um, to the terminal. And we're going to start in 19.1. Again, we're in the SQL shell uh, connected to the 19.1 cluster. We're going to run the query that I just um, mentioned uh, uh, against this TPCH data set in 19.1. And we'll see, uh, we'll see how fast um, it returns in 19.1. OK, so seven seconds. Um, this can really vary in 19.1. It could be seven seconds. I've seen 14 seconds. Um, now let's do the same, the same query against the same data set in 19.2. Um, 2.7 seconds. So that's a dramatic, um, a dramatic speed up from 19.1 to 19.2. Um, and uh, um, this is just one example of a, of a kind of analytic style query that, that you're going to see this benefit for. Cool. So I'm um, moving on to uh, the two or two of the major usability improvements in 19.2. We're going to look at um, a few more slides here, and then we're going to pivot back to the terminal and the admin UI for, for some more demonstrations. Um, so back when we were demoing parallel commits, we talked about the effect of network latency in a geo-distributed database. That is the time it takes to move between physical locations especially those far away from each other, like regions of the country. Or even um, different continents across the globe, because CockroachDB can be run in a single region, single continent, or multiple continents. In all cases, the more hops between locations and the longer the distance between those, the, those locations, um, the more time it takes to complete the client request. And this is where CockroachDB's geo-partitioning feature comes in. Essentially, instead of letting CockroachDB naturally balance the table's data evenly across all localities of your cluster, say all three regions of the US, you tell CockroachDB to split the table's data by a specific location value in each row, say a city column. And then um, you use a feature called replication zones to pin each partition to the nodes that are, are closest. <coughs> And by doing this, um, read and write queries become very fast in the low um, milliseconds because they don't have to travel far distances to reach the relevant data. In this graphic, it's just a, it's a, a, read, a read request, and you can see that it's, it's never leaving the US central region. The same thing would be, do, would be true for writes. And this really reduces network latency dramatically. And um, ultimately, what this means is an end-to-end end -end user experience that feels um, very instantaneous. And also, um, importantly, um, you're able to comply with data domiciling regulations to keep users' data within spe specific geographic bounds. So there's actually uh, multiple benefits you get from geo-partitioning here. 
So it's a really powerful feature of CockroachDB, and a lot of users are leveraging it as they scale beyond um, a single region. That said, we know it's not especially easy to set up. There are just too many commands to execute, um, and it's sometimes hard to retrieve all of the information you need to do so quickly and, and correctly. So in 19.2, uh, this is where we focused. So first, um, it's now possible to name partitions identically across indexes of a table. And this makes it possible to use a single command to create replication zones for all partitions of a given name. And this saves you many uh, manual steps and, you know, and it avoids a lot of potential um, user error. Um, and also during and after partitioning, um, you now have, have greater visibility into the process and it's easier to review what's in place and confirm um, that, that, that all is well. So let's take a look at these improvements, but, but let's do it in the context of the other big usability improvement we want to highlight. And, um, and uh, that is some great changes uh, that we've made to the cockroach demo command. So if you're not familiar, familiar with it, essentially wherever you have a copy of the cockroach binary, you can run a single command cockroach demo to start a temporary in-memory uh, CockroachDB cluster with immediate access to an interactive SQL shell and, uh, and an admin UI. And so this command is, is great for quick SQL experimentation or, or for you know, having a, a simple backend for local app development. And it's been around for a few releases already, but what's new in CockroachDB 19.2 makes it even more interesting um, and convenient. And so now when you use Cockroach Demo in 19.2, you get a, a test data set preloaded into the cluster. And um, especially exciting, you get a temporary enterprise license. So it's, it's easy to request a trial license for a persistent cluster um, through our website. That's really easy. But if you, if you just want to test out the mechanics of, say, geopartitioning, um, which we'll do in a moment, a cockroach demo is now all you need for that. Um, and also, there's, there are a handful of new flags um, in cockroach demo that let you scale and geodistribute the cluster with, with no effort at all. Specifically, there's a new nodes flag that I'm going to show you that lets you um, specify as many in-memory nodes as you like with default um, regions and localities automatically in place um, as of um, six nodes. And, and there's, a, there's a handful of other really cool um, new flags uh, that are outlined in the documentation. Um, okay, so let's finally get back to a live demo and use Cockroach <coughs> Demo to, um, to see some of the geopartitioning improvements that we just, um, just talked about. Great, so I'm gonna open a new tab, increase the font. So we're just on my computer now. I'm not connected, I'm not on a VM, I'm not connected to one of those real um, Cockroach DB clusters right now. Just on my computer, I have, a, I have a copy of the cockroach binary on my computer. And I'm just gonna run this cockroach demo um, nodes, node, uh, a command with the nodes flag saying I want nine nodes in this in-memory cluster. And with that single command, as I mentioned before, I have immediate access um, to a SQL shell against this cluster. So if I say like list out the databases in this cluster, we can see there's a bunch of default databases. Mover, that's the default data set that I mentioned that's just kind of preloaded there. Um, and we also get um, immediate access to an admin UI. Um, and so you can see here that um, we have nine nodes. And um, if we look at the node map, I mentioned that when, as of six nodes, we just kind of, we, 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 uh, we make sure that all the nodes have kind of default localities. When you have nine nodes, um, your, your, your cluster is spread across um, the U.S. and Europe. So we have three nodes in, in Europe West, three nodes in U.S. East, and three nodes um, in, in U.S. West. So that's, that's really um, nice and convenient. And um, so that the, the, the preloaded data I also want to drill into because we're going to actually leverage it a little bit. Um, so there's a mover data set that's preloaded. And mover is a fictional vehicle sharing application that we've talked about um, in the past, um, uh, in past webinars, we feature it in our documentation. Um, it's open source right now, but we, the data set is preloaded into a cockroach demo cluster. Um, and so let's drill into the vehicles table because this is where we're gonna actually get into geopartitioning. So we can see it's a simple table, you know, vehicles with a bunch of columns. Um, now, but thinking about this cluster, this cluster is spread across, um, you know, from the US to Europe, across from the West Coast, East Coast of US, all the way to the West region of Europe. 
So for this, for this table, let's say that we want to insert a, you know, a vehicle into this table. Um, basically, let's say that we're on the West Coast um, and, um, and the lease for the table is on the East Coast of the US. So that, that request is going to be routed to the East Coast and then the leaseholder um, for, uh, for the relevant range is, gonna, is going to trigger um, a consensus operation and reach out to the replicas that are on the West Coast and in, and in Europe and wait to get a majority or get consensus from one of the replicas and respond um, to, the, to the gateway on the West Coast. There's a lot of back and forth across very large distances. And so geopartitioning is the way, um, is, is the way to solve this. So what we're gonna do is we're going to, we're gonna say for the, the data in the vehicles table, we wanna break it up into chunks. And we're gonna say there's you know, a portion of the vehicles table that is only relevant for um, users on the West Coast or the Western region of the US. There's portion that are only relevant for users in the East of the US. There's portion that are only relevant for, um, uh, for users in, in Europe. Um, we're gonna partition it that way. And then again, we're gonna use replication zones to, to actually um, pin the data to the relevant locations. All right. So we'll go back into the SQL shell here. All right, and let's look at this. So, so there are two commands here, um, alter table vehicles partition by. So this first command, we are partitioning the table um, into three partitions, you know, a US West partition, a US East partition, an EU West partition, just like I said. Um, and in each case, we're saying, okay, any row that has the Los Angeles value in the city column belongs in the US West partition. That's basically how this works. But we're also um, partitioning a secondary index that's been defined on this table. You always want to partition, I mean, almost always, I'd say want to partition secondary indexes with the table itself. Um, and the thing to call out here is you can see that they're, they're the same number of partitions and they're named identically. So in the secondary index, all entries in the secondary index where Los Angeles is the city is going to end up in a partition named US West. And it's named the same as the partition for the primary index or the table US West. And this is going to, this is going to really speed up uh, the next step, which is defining replication zones. But before we do that, um, I'm going to go back to the admin UI. This was the view before partitioning. If I refresh, um, this is nice because now um, we see um, the create table statement that, that you would use to, to, to recreate this table from scratch. So we see all the partitioning information is, is now exposed to you um, in the admin UI. Create table, all the columns, all the partitions that have been defined on the index, all the partitions that have been defined on the table itself. So this is nice. And you get the same exact output, by the way, if you use the show create table um, um, uh, statement in the SQL shell. Um, so this is essentially the same thing. One other really nice thing here is we see this warning at the bottom. It says partition table with no zone configurations. So what that's telling us is that you've partitioned the data, you've defined these partitions, but the data has not moved around. You haven't told CockroachDB what to do with those partitions. And um, that, that's great. That's just a tip for you that, you know, this isn't actually going to do anything for you. It's just kind of broken up the data. Now you need to actually control where that data gets, gets located. And that's, that's the next step. All right, so back in the SQL shell, um, we just ran three commands. We're in the, run that last one. So let's look at just one first. So this command is saying create a replication zone for partitions named US West, any partition named US West, West belonging to any index on the vehicles table. And this is where, uh, this is new in 19.2, the syntax vehicles at asterisks. Um, and so with a single command, we can create the relevant replication zones for all partitions of this name. Whereas in 19.1 and earlier, this would have been multiple um, commands uh, with a lot of you know, opportunities for user error. Um, so this is really nice. So we did the same thing um, for the US East partition, same thing for the US West um, partition. And if we go back into the admin UI and I refresh the screen, we no longer see, see that warning, but rather, again, we see all of the commands required to recreate this table and all of its, um, its data location um, sort of um, configuration from scratch. So not only do we see the table creation schema and partitioning, but we also see the commands that you would need to run to um, create all of the replication zones for the partitions that we've, we've defined. 
So this is a lot more visibility into the state of geopartitioning um, and uh, improved usability into the creation uh, of the replication zones for, uh, for partitions. And, um, and finally, back in the SQL shell, the admin UI is not the only place where you get more visibility into this. There's a new um, command. I'm going to copy and paste it so I make sure I get it right. Um, yeah, so there's a new, a new SQL command called show partitions that lets you um, list out the partitions that have been defined for a table and it gives you a lot of information. There's a lot that's returned, so I'm going to have to zoom out so we can see the whole thing. Can't really read this well, but just to give you a sense, what we see here is all of the partitions, every partition that's been defined on the vehicles table, um, for example, US West, defined on the primary index, that's the table itself. There's another US West that's been defined on the secondary index. And we can see that this, those, those two are partitioned for the Los Angeles um, partition value. We can see the constraints that have been defined for those partitions. We can also see the other um, parameters um, that have been, de have been put into place by default that you can control. But these are the other parameters within the replication zones defined for these partitions. So a lot of, of great visibility um, into partitioning in 19.2. So um, that was a lot. Um, wrapping up the demo, um, and before we move over to Q&A, um, let's review. What did we see today? We saw that parallel commits significantly um, improve performance, especially in geo-distributed clusters, but also in single region, by cutting the commit latency of a transaction in half, from two rounds of consensus down to one. We also saw that vectorized query execution brings significant speed up for more analytics-style queries, we saw that geopartitioning is now easier with fewer manual commands and, um, and greater visibility into what's happening and the state of geopartitioning. And uh, we saw that cockroach demo um, now makes it even easier to do quick local testing um, or local app development with a preloaded data set and uh, an enterprise license for trying out features uh, like geopartitioning. So really, really cool stuff in 19.2. Um, um, and then we also, you know, are listing out here and we'll share with you in the follow-up email to this, uh, to this webinar, um, a lot of resources for you. So there's the full 19.2 release notes with a lot of information about these features, as well as a lot of the other features in 19.2. And then there's, as I mentioned, great blog posts and great documentation on all of the features um, that I covered. So that is, um, those are the highlights from 19.2. <coughs> all right. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much. Um, we have some time now for questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, we had a few come in during the webinar that um, we could address. Um, I think there was one. Yeah, one I answered directly. Already. We can, yeah, we can answer that. We can answer that yeah, one just sure. for everyone's, everyone's <clears throat> knowledge. Um, so Bram is going to answer one of the questions that came in. Yeah, so it was a question of what types of queries are likely to spill over to disk. And really, it's any longer running uh, select query can spill over to disk. Um, right now, our vectorized execution does not spill over to disk, uh, but it most likely will happen for our next major release, uh, which should be around April, I think. 20.1 uh, is what we're going to call that one. So there are plans to do that as we move more things into vectorized execution. Um, but really, when, you, when we're talking about larger SQL queries, it really depends on how big the buffer is that you set on your, your cockroach uh, start command um, and the number of results. Cool. Cool, thank you. Um, and then we had another question come in um, about Azure. You want to read that one out? Yeah, so the, it, the question is essentially, when are we going to be supporting Azure? Uh, in a number of different things. So I actually reached out during this uh, call to ask the different groups. I've got back, heard back from the Cockroach Cloud team that uh, they're not planning Azure support in, within the next six months unless there is pressure to do so. So if you're interested in that, um, please uh, let us know and we will push that through because uh, we are starting to look at Azure as a place to run Cockroach more often. And we have our cloud report, which that's going out soon, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, so our annual cloud report on how well each cloud stacks up against the, each other. And last year, we had done only uh, AWS versus GCP. And this year, we're actually adding Azure into the mix, which is really cool. And you can see how well they're doing in comparison. 
Um, so that's happening. As far as documentation on getting started, I'm going to hand that over to Jesse since this is short. Sure. So, <laughs> so what, what was the question? Um, are we going to be adding getting started pages uh, for Azure because we definitely ah. have them uh, okay. for the other clouds? Okay. Yeah. No, that's a really good good point. I mean, so again, as Brian mentioned, it's not going to be possible to to you know to request a, a cockroach cloud cluster on Azure. But if yeah. you're wanting to to run a self hosted cluster on, a cluster on Azure, we actually do have deployment guides on that. So I would they might not be so easy to find, but if you look on our doc site under deployment um, manual deployment, you're going to find um, uh, you know, uh, tutorials that are specific to GCP, to AWS, to Azure, to DigitalOcean, as well as um, deployment guide um, on, uh, you know, using uh, orchestration tools like Kubernetes on uh, Google's Kubernetes engine, Amazon's Kubernetes engine. So, so we do have it. You have to, you have to look for deploy CockroachDB on Microsoft Azure and you'll find it. And the, the instructions there should I hope help you. I mean, it's pretty end to end, you know, for a, both a secure and insecure cluster um, following all of our production best practices. Um, so um, if you haven't found it, um, uh, go, go check it. And, uh, and then if you have any, any recommendations or suggestions that our docs are open source. Um, so please, you know, go to our GitHub repo, open an issue, tell us what problems you had, um, and we will definitely address them. I, I post the link in the, the Q&A section of the, the Zoom call mm -hmm. here. Um, as well, there was a question about getting it cockroach into the uh, Azure marketplace. I know we're working on that. I've heard some talk in sales about it, mm -hmm. um, but I, I reached out. I haven't heard back yet, but I'm pretty sure that is indeed coming because obviously we want to be in every cloud provider's uh, self-hosted automatic setup. Okay. Um, well, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, a reminder, just fill out the survey when the webinar is ended and um, we'll be sending out a recording um, later with the, the whole recording so you can rewatch it if you want to. That's it. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you.